questions. There's just not quite enough time this afternoon. And we have to move on to the next item of business, which is a statement by John Swinney on Scotland's education reforms. The Cabinet Secretary will, as usual, take questions at the end of his statement. I would encourage all members who wish to ask Mr Swinney a question to press their request to speak buttons uh, as soon as possible. And I call on John Swinney. Presiding officer, the aim of this government's education policy is to ensure that we achieve excellence and equity for all of our children and young people in a highly performing education system. To make this a reality, we must raise the bar for all and close the attainment gap in our schools. Our education system is already delivering improving results. For the third year in a row, we have seen more than 150,000 higher passes, despite falling pupil numbers, and nearly 60,000 skills-based awards and achievements. We are seeing the proportion of young people getting qualifications at SCQF levels 4, 5 and 6, mainly National 4s, National 5s and Hires, increase and increase fastest in the most deprived areas. We are seeing almost 23% of school leavers in the most deprived areas going into higher education, compared with 16.5% seven years ago. Interna international evidence demonstrates that successful education systems are those where decisions about children's education are made as close to them as possible. That is why our approach is to empower schools, to empower head teachers, teachers and parents and the wider school community to make these key decisions which affect the educational outcomes of children and young people. We set this out in our manifesto when we, will, when we said that we will put teachers, parents and communities in the driving seat. Presiding officer, we have a great many high quality professionals working in Scottish education, but I do not believe that they are currently sufficiently empowered to work together and to use their skills, judgment and creativity in the way they think best. That is critical to ensure the potential of curriculum for excellence is achieved. Empowered professionals must also be supported by specific measures in the National Improvement Framework to secure improvements in Scottish education. The combination of the Scottish Attainment Challenge and Pupil Equity Funding are already delivering results by empowering the teaching profession. Teachers and head teachers are taking radical, focused and innovative approaches to improve outcomes because this funding puts them in the driving seat. The interim evaluation of the Attainment Scotland Fund showed that 78% of head teachers had already seen an improvement in attainment and well-being as a result of the fund. And nearly all head teachers, 97%, expected to see further improvements in the coming five years. Some would say that all of this is progress enough, that the system does not need further interventions from government. Some would say that many schools already enjoy the kind of empowerment that our reforms are aiming for, that there is great work already being done in a number of areas, and there is. In other words, that some children and young people have got the sort of education system they need and that some of them will reach their potential. Some children is simply not good enough. We must raise the bar and close the gap for all. That is why we published Education Governance Next Steps a year ago. Since then, a significant amount of progress has been made. We worked intensively with local government to reach agreement on regional improvement collaboratives to provide additional support to schools. All six regional improvement collaboratives are now up and running with their leadership appointed and already collaborating with Education Scotland to respond to local needs and aspirations. The first set of regional improvement plans have been developed and the second plans are due in September. All of this has been achieved at a pace that would previously have been thought highly unlikely, if not impossible but achieved as a result of creative joint working between national and local government. Next Steps also committed the Scottish Government to work with partners to support readiness for a school and teacher-led system. This led to rationalising the existing structures and governance arrangements in Scottish education. I now chair the Scottish Education Council, which brings together young people, education leaders and representatives from local authorities, the teaching profession and our partners in COSLA. It works collaboratively to ensure that there is a system-wide focus on improvement and to agree priorities for improvement activity and delivery. Education Scotland has taken significant action to deliver on its enhanced role and remit. The Scottish College for Educational Leadership is now integrated into Education Scotland, building further the, the culture and capacity of leadership throughout the system. 
Last November, we consulted on proposals for achieving empowerment through the Education Bill, including the Head Teachers Charter. Our aim was to ensure schools had wide-ranging powers over their own management, staffing and what is taught in their classrooms, creating a culture of empowerment that enables all professionals to contribute to the agenda of improvement. The analysis of the consultation, which was published in March this year, showed a great many people agree wholeheartedly with our aim of school empowerment, but many were not convinced about all of the details of how we plan to achieve that aim. These voices raise the question of whether we could deliver the Head Teachers Charter faster, with less disruption, in partnership with local authorities. And if so, why wait 18 months for an education bill? In light of these responses, I've been in detailed discussions with local government for some months. This work has not always been easy, but I can announce that we have reached a clear shared commitment. Presiding officer, I am today fast tracking the reform of Scottish education. The Scottish Government and Scotland's councils have reached an agreement that endorses and embraces the principles of school empowerment and provides clear commitment to a school and teacher led education system. And it does so without the need to wait 18 months for an education bill. So while I'm publishing a draft education bill today, along with its accompanying documents and appropriate impact assessments, I have decided that I will not introduce the bill to Parliament at this time. Instead of waiting for the passage of legislation, which cannot be fully enforced until 2019 or 2020, we have an opportunity to reform our schools more quickly through our investment in consensus building and collaboration rather than through legislation. In coming to this decision, I've also reflected on the advice of the International Council of Education Advisors, who encouraged me to consider the benefits of pursuing a collaborative approach rather than legislating. I've listened to this advice and taken the view that by building on the joint agreement with local government, we have greater prospects of achieving more at a swifter pace. This means that the Head Teachers Charter can be, become a reality faster. School leaders will be able to make the key decisions on crucial areas of curriculum, improvement, staffing and budget, crucial to ensuring effective learning and teaching and doing those, uh, taking those actions more quickly. And by implementing jointly with local government and the education profession, we can develop guidance on empowerment and the charter as a matter of priority and more quickly than statutory guidance under an education bill. On budget powers, we have already begun work with our local government partners on new guidance for devolved school management schemes. And on parental involvement and pupil engagement, we will launch a joint action plan on parental engagement next month and will continue the work started in this year of young people in relation to enhancing the voice of pupils in schools. Finally, on the General Teaching Council for Scotland, we will explore what can be done within the current scope of legislation to provide the benefits of regulation and registration to a wider group of education professionals. I do, however, accept the strength of feeling from teachers about the body's independence and its guardianship of professional standards. Presiding officer, by taking the steps I have set out to Parliament today, we are demonstrating a clear commitment to working with local government and education professionals. We are fast-tracking progress and we expect progress to be sustained and swift. But I must also make this very clear today. If sufficient progress is not made over the next 12 months to deliver the empowerment of schools we have agreed with local authorities, I will return to Parliament and introduce an education bill. Presiding officer, the approach I've set out today requires tailored and targeted support. I'm therefore announcing a total of £46 million of investment to support the improvement agenda. In addition to existing leadership development programmes, I can announce today a further investment of up to £4 million over three years to ensure head teachers can access high quality professional learning, including further investment in the highly regarded Columba 1400 Leadership Academies. I can also announce up to £10 million to enhance regional capacity to support schools. This funding through regional improvement collaboratives and Education Scotland working together will help schools to close the attainment gap and tackle rural deprivation support collaboration to share best practice and the delivery of regional interventions. And to ensure we maintain progress for looked after children, I will be making funding available of around eight million pounds for the remainder of this year and 12 million pounds in each of the subsequent two years 
to supp supplement funding, pupil equity funding, and challenge authorities and schools programmes to assist the opportunities available to looked after children. Presiding officer, this government believes that every child in Scotland, no matter their background, should have the very best start in life. This landmark agreement published today marks the next phase in reforming our school education system. It means it can be delivered more quickly than by legislation. It means that we will empower teachers to drive improvement in schools and help pupils flourish. It means the whole system, schools, councils and regional improvement collaboratives, all focused on improving the outcomes for ch Scotland's children and young people. Teachers and parents will be the key decision makers in the life of a school. Education remains by far the most effective means we have to improve the life chances of all of our young people. I'm confident that this approach, one that builds consensus and fosters collaboration, but with high expectations for what we can achieve together, is the right approach for Scotland. Thank you very much. We'll now take questions, starting with Liz Smith. Thank you, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for a prior sight of the statement. The new education bill will deliver the biggest and most radical change to how our schools are run. It will give head teachers significant new powers, influence and responsibilities, formally establishing them as leaders of learning and teaching. Cabinet Secretary, that was the flagship promise of the First Minister in the Scottish Government's programme for government just a few months ago. And you yourself are on record saying that this bill was the best chance we had in a generation to reform our schools and raise attainment. Presiding officer, I am frankly astonished by the content of this statement this afternoon, as will be thousands of parents, teachers and young people across Scotland. And in that light, Cabinet Secretary, I have only one question. Is the Cabinet Secretary not embarrassed by this complete shambles of a U-turn which not only breaks the SNP's promise to the people of Scotland, mm -hmm. but which now leaves schools with even more uncertainty about their future under this SNP government. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the one word answer to Liz Smith is no. I have, what I've done here is I have pursued the policy objective of the government, which is to empower our schools and to negotiate an agreement with local authorities which enables us to empower our schools faster than can be achieved through legislation. So the policy intent of the government is absolutely intact and we will pursue that to deliver, we will pursue that to deliver the objectives that the government has set out. And in relation to the experience of schools, what I see in schools is schools using the freedoms that this government has given them through pupil equity funding, which Liz Smith voted against in the budget, to ensure that they are able to close the poverty-related attainment gap and improve the opportunities for young people. That is what I see going on in the schools of Scotland. And what will come from this agreement that I have negotiated with local government is the opportunity at a faster pace to deliver the reforms this government is committed to and which we are determined to deliver. Ian Gray. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and my thanks too for uh, early sight of the Cabinet Secretary's statement. Well, what a shambles indeed. For two years, parents, teachers, educationalists and the government's own international advisers have told the Education Secretary that his education bill was unwanted, unnecessary and misguided. But he carried on regardless. And now, at the 11th hour, his flagship legislation has sailed off into the sunset. The First Minister's top priority, her sacred obligation, is now reduced to just another last-minute, cobbled-together joint agreement. The only thing, the only thing being fast-tracked here is the mother of all ministerial climb-downs. The Cabinet Secretary has failed, and he knows he has failed, to marshal support in or out of this parliament for his bill. His blushes cannot be spared. Will he just own up and admit his education bill is dead? And will he now do what he always should have done, restore the 7.5% he's cut from school budgets 
and address the 20 per cent erosion of our teachers' pay. Cabinet Secretary. When Ian Gray talks about the marshalling of support for the bill, what I've concentrated on, and none of this has been the product of um, a last-minute discussion. This has been the product of months and months of dialogue with local government, culminating, culminating in the culminating in the unanimous agreement by all local authority leaders of the contents of the education bill. And that was the position arrived at by COSDA leaders at their meeting at the end of May. And what I'm doing here is responding positively to the discussions that we have had and recognising that we can achieve greater progress at a faster pace by working together with local authorities. So that is what the government has opted to do. But I reserve the right to ensure that we take forward that agenda in a speedy and timorous fashion and to return to Parliament if we are not able to pursue the collaborative approach that I have set out. Now, on the question of resources, I would have thought by now Ian Gray might have welcomed the fact that last year, Local authority expenditure on education increased by 3.2%. I would have expected Ian Gray might have welcomed the fact that local authorities are projecting to increase their expenditure on education in this current financial year by 3.8%. I would have expected Ian Gray might have supported the £120 million annually in pupil equity funding going into our schools to transform the lives of young people but, of course, Ian Gray doesn't support any of that because he voted against it in the budget. And I'm afraid Ian Gray can't wriggle away from the consequences of his foolish errors earlier on this year. Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Jenny uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Cabinet Secretary detailed in his statement, all six regional collaborative, uh, improvement collaboratives have now been established and their respective leadership roles filled. But can the Cabinet Secretary outline how the collaboratives will help to drive improvements in learning and teaching at a local level? And I remind members, I'm the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary. What we expect of regional improvement collaboratives is for them to engage closely with the work that is going on within individual schools and to respond significantly to the demands and the requests for improvement support from individual schools. So the agreement that I've set out today puts schools into the driving seat of determining the enhancements to, uh, to, to learning and teaching that they require and to seek those from the regional improvement collaboratives which are part of the uh, combined work of local authorities and Education Scotland and the Scottish Government. So in that very focused way, we want to support the enhancement of learning and teaching in the classroom. And one of the key tests of the success and the effectiveness of regional improvement collaboratives will, what they, will be what they can achieve in improving classroom practice. Oliver Mundell to be followed by Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is quite clearly uh, not a case of job done. It's job too difficult. Given the Cabinet Secretary's frequent pleas uh, to this Parliament that the bill was essential in terms of raising attainment. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary why he introduced the bill, or the, what was bringing forward the bill in the first place, why he's changed his mind, and why he's brought to an end engagement with other political parties who might have been willing to work with him? Yeah, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. What, what uh, has changed my mind has been the collaboration we have been able to build up with local authorities. And I'm very clear about that point. We have managed to get local authorities to a position where they are taking forward a shared agenda. They're committed to that shared agenda, which is focused on empowering schools through the design of a head teacher's charter that gives head teachers um, much greater influence over the issues of curriculum and staffing and funding and improvement than is the case currently, and enables those head teachers and schools to lead that process of improving educational performance. So on the basis that I am constantly appeal to in this parliament to build agreement and to build consensus that is what i have sought and i've secured that agreement from local authorities and i'm determined to work with local authorities to make sure we deliver that impact on the education of young people which as mr mundell will already know is is, is improving already 
with the data that we published last week demonstrating that the attainment gap is starting to close and the work that has been taken forward collaboratively within Scottish education is beginning to have an effect. Mary Feed, be followed by George Adam. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how he will determine whether sufficient progress has been made in the next 12 months? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I will seek the, um, an independent assessment of whether or not sufficient progress has been made. Uh, I will look to that uh, independent assessment to make a judgment about whether or not uh, the commitments that have been made in this agreement have been fulfilled in, uh, in any sense in a reasonable fashion uh, within the 12-month period. And that independent analysis will be published and will inform my view as to whether to introduce legislation at a later stage. But I make clear to Mary Fee and to Parliament that I would prefer not to do that because I think we can achieve more progress if we fulfil the spirit and the letter of the agreement that I've reached with local authorities. George Adams will be followed by Ross Greer. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's funding announcement to enhance regional capacity to support schools. Would he agree with me that closing the poverty-related attainment gap requires the collaboration of a wide range of public services and not just schools? Cabinet Secretary. I, I accept uh, Mr Adams' point. Uh, there is a, a, a whole range of different influences that can be brought to bear on the, uh, the, the opportunities available to young people. Um, that support can be provided by a number of professionals, but the key uh, element of that is that all of those professionals must be focused on how we ensure we, our combined actions, get it right for every child. So that very focused policy approach is an essential part of how we engage in supporting young people and making sure they're able to fulfil their potential as a consequence of the joint working that takes place across our public services. Ross Greer to be followed by Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This is a humiliating moment for the Education Secretary as he's forced to flee from Parliament. His proposals have been rejected by teachers, parents, young people, councils and education experts, and he knows they'd be rejected by MSPs as well, so he's avoiding the Parliament completely. The £10 million announced for the unwanted and unnecessary regional collaboratives could have instead been 260 desperately needed teachers over the rest of this parliamentary term. So can the Deputy First Minister just accept that the number one issue in Scottish schools at the moment is a lack of staff and resources due to his budget cuts and that shelving this doomed bill gives him a chance to admit the mistakes made over the last decade and to change course? Cabinet Secretary. Well, unless, unless I'm mistaken, I'm in Parliament just now answering questions from members of parliament and explaining the government's position. So on a, on a matter of pure technical reality, I'm actually here uh, in response to Mr Greer's question. In relation to the objectives and of, the government's, uh, of the government's agenda, I have set out very clearly to parliament today that the government's agenda to empower schools lies at the heart of the agreement we have reached with local authorities. And the conclusion I've come to is that I can make more progress working in a collaborative way with local authorities to advance that agenda than I can through legislation. Now, if that results in the creation of a school-led, empowered education system within our individual schools in Scotland, then the government's policy objective will have succeeded. And, the, and, and I'm sure uh, Mr Greer will be there encouraging us on all the way. What I'd say to Mr Greer about resources is this, and I, I have made a number of announcements today about enhancing the investment in education, but the government has been strengthening the uh, investment in education through pupil equity funding and the Scottish Attainment Challenge. We are seeing the effect of that in individual schools. We are seeing it with the closure of the poverty-related attainment gap, and we're also seeing it as a result of the government's budget settlements in the improvements in investment in education in Scotland. So I think all of these factors come together to demonstrate the important progress we are making on education. That is something that should give us encouragement about our prospects to close the, the attainment gap in Scottish education and to ensure that we fulfil the life chances of every young person. And that is what the government is unreservedly focused on achieving as a consequence of our education policy. 
Tavish Scott to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, if, the, uh, if education is the number one priority of the First Minister, uh, why is she not here today? Uh, or is it that the ministerial reshuffle is more important than Scotland's schools? And if this bill is, why, is so important, why is he, why is he, uh, why is he ditching it? Why is he uh, ditching it, yet holding it as a sword of Damocles over our councils? Do as I say, or I'll be after you. Is that really collaboration? Number second. Uh, well, uh, you know, just. Just as I am here answering questions which Mr Greer didn't seem to think I was, uh, the First Minister can't be in two places at the one time. And, um, so, uh, and, she's, um, uh, and the First Minister is taking forward the Government's agenda as she always does, and I'm here to explain our position on education reforms. In relation to Mr Scott's second point, I, I've, Mr Scott regularly encourages me to engage in dialogue and discussion with external parties. And that is exactly what I am doing. But, and, and that's what's informed the conclusions that I've come to in Parliament today. But I think it's, it's only fair that I make clear to everybody the determination of the government to pursue this policy agenda. And I want to make sure that the commitments we have entered into in good faith with local authorities are taken forward and that we have every opportunity to strengthen Scottish education as a result. But I must reserve the government's position to legislate if we are unable to make the progress that's been committed to in our agreement with local authorities. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Alison Harris. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to outline how the government's plans will allow for new opportunities for professional development and teaching and how this will help raise standards and close the attainment gap? Cabinet Secretary. One of the important priorities that we're taking forward as a consequence of our dialogue with professional associations in the through the International Summit on the Teaching Profession is the design of additional career pathways for uh, teachers to enhance their professional development and professional skill uh, within the classroom without having to seek other opportunities through administrative leadership. And I think, frankly, that we have narrowed those career development opportunities to too great an extent within Scottish education. We need to open them back up again. And we have um, invited um, Moira Boland of the University of Glasgow to take forward uh, a panel who will look at the development of those career pathways in consultation with the professional associations to provide the career development opportunities for individual teachers uh, to enhance their practice. And in addition to that, the resources I've announced today and the focus of regional improvement collaboratives are all designed to ensure that we strengthen the learning and teaching within the classroom and that we invest in that learning and teaching to strengthen the opportunities available for young people. Alison Harris, to be followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Not long ago, the Cabinet Secretary confirmed at members' que at education questions, and I quote, we will all have the opportunity to vote in Parliament on the proposed education bill. Will this ever happen, Cabinet Secretary? Cabinet well, Secretary. It, 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 it might, uh, but it will be dependent on whether, it will depend on whether we make sufficient progress through the joint agreement with local authorities. And what matters to me is the outcome that we achieve. If the outcome is that we achieve empowered schools who can help to raise attainment, then for me, that will be job done because we will be closing the poverty-related attainment gap and we'll be succeeding in our policy objectives. If we have to do that through legislation, then we will have to do it through legislation. But I would rather pursue the approach of collaboration, which Parliament constantly asks me to take forward, We've secured that agreement and I look forward to taking that forward. Gillian Martin to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I note that in the last five minutes, Councillor Stephen McCabe of Cosla has just said, I am pleased that our concerns have been recognised by the Scottish Government and I believe that the principles we've agreed will allow us to focus on improving outcomes for children and young people. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what discussions he's had with teaching unions or what discussions he hopes to have with teaching unions as a result of today's statement? Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Officer, I've, um, en I engage extensively with the professional associations. Um, we've discussed uh, these issues over um, the course of the last few months. Uh, I will continue that dialogue with the professional associations. I'm particularly interested in the uh, involvement of the professional associations in the career pathways development and also in the work of the regional improvement collaboratives. And they will, of course, be um, integral to the discussions we have as we take forward this agenda uh, to ensure that the, uh, the, the legitimate and important interests of employees uh, are properly taken into account in the reforms that we undertake. 
Joanne Lamond to be followed, if we've got time, by Richard Lockhead. Joanne Lamond. Thank you very much. Um, the Cabinet Secretary says he recognised the strength of feeling regarding the reputation and independence of the General Teaching Council for Scotland. And I should say that that was a strength of feeling that could not be overstated in the consultation that the Education Committee carried out. So why will he not today just commit to dropping his plan to abolish this vital institution? It will, uh, but my, my, first of all, my plan was not to uh, abolish the General Teaching Council. It was to ensure the General Teaching Council um, became a broader body that could regulate a wider range of organisations in the education workforce. Uh, I've recognised, however, the strength of feeling that Joanne Lamont highlights in my response. And if Joanne Lamont, I appreciate she won't have a time to look at the draft bill, but the draft bill does not include provisions to reform the General Teaching Council. So I accept that those proposals should not go forward because there is not sufficient agreement for that reform to be undertaken. What I've asked the General Teaching Council to explore is how within its existing legislative structure it can undertake the regulation of a broader range of educational professionals who I think all of us would generally agree um, should be brought into the ambit of regulation. Uh, I'm thinking particularly in relation to um, uh, music tutors, which is one of the, the groupings of staff that um, the General Teaching Council is already exploring to bring within its locus. Um, and I look forward to continuing those discussions with the General Teaching Council. Richard Lockett. Can I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement of £10 million through regional collaboration to tackle, amongst other things, rural deprivation? And can he say a little more about that? And does he also recognise the UK Government have also responsibility to tackle rural deprivation, given the number of witnesses that appeared before the Education Committee who said that welfare reform is making it much more difficult to close the attainment gap in Scotland schools? Briefly, Cabinet Secretary. Well, Mr Lockhead's last point is uh, beyond dispute that it is increasingly difficult to tackle the poverty-related attainment gap or our challenges made greater because of the implications of welfare reform that are undertaken by the United Kingdom government. That should not in any way diminish our determination to work to try to achieve those objectives, but it will certainly make the challenge all the greater. Um, in relation to Mr Lockhead's point on the funding resources that I've announced today, these funding resources are important to support the regional collaboratives around the country, particularly in rural areas, to overcome some of the challenges that exist, particularly driven by rurality, and to ensure that we have in place support for, for example, um, the enhancement of members of the teaching profession to make sure there is access, despite the geographical challenges of rural areas, to those learning and teaching um, uh, enhancements, uh, and to, to guarantee that in rural areas, we have a comprehensive strategy to tackle the issue of um, the poverty-related attainment gap, which of course is less visible in our rural areas, but nonetheless just as significant and as serious as it is in our urban areas, and the necessity of closing it is just as important. Thank you very much, and that concludes our statement. We will now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on defending the powers of the Scottish Parliament. We'll just take a few seconds for ministers and members to change seats.